pleasure to be here and uh, tell you what Peter and I have been thinking about this past year. Um, so, <coughs> as many we program to try and see if we can prove the four color theorem, and um, that goes by trying to use instanton for homology to define an invariant of uh, spatial graphs. Um, and uh, so, the gadget that we want to think about. is this. So a trivalent graph embedded in three space or more generally a three manifold. I mean, it could be a knot. There's something a little more interesting. Um, you know, it very much you know, depends on how the thing sits in three space. So either the abstract graphs are the same, but uh, the way they're embedded is different in the, those examples. Um, there's a, a nice graph. Uh, how many graph theorists recognize the graph? Why is it important? So that's, this is, the abstract graph is the Peterson graph. It's the, um, it's the smallest snark, not three colorable graph. Um, so what instanton homology does for you is it defines <coughs> Um, I have a hard time saying it. A puncture, if I say it. Um, so, <coughs> on a certain, I hate to say it too, category, um, <laughs> the, the category is the set, in this case, of the three manifold, a, uh, which is closed oriented and connected. Uh, it contains a web. So, a web is again a trivalent graph. Uh, embedded in the three manifold, and, and we need a little base point issue, so it needs a frame base point. Uh, a morphism is a uh, triple consisting of a four manifold with boundary. The boundary is going to um, have an incoming three manifold and a going three manifold. Uh, there's a sigma here is a foam, which is a four dimensional analog of a web. So it's a uh, singular, it's a sort of two complex that's embedded in the four manifold where um, the singularities in the two complex are allowed to be uh, anything that's in a neighborhood of the cone on the one skeleton of a tetrahedron. So um, that's the gadget that induces a map. And there's also a, um, a base point so if I have base points in uh, the incoming and outgoing guy, I need a path that joins them and a framing of that path. Okay, so <laughs> um, the invariant that we defined is a, a functor from this category, two vector spaces over field with two elements. You know, field with one element, an element appears in the talk. Um, <laughs> and the, the main conjecture is that uh, if, you, if the web lies in a plane in the three sphere, then the dimension of this invariant is the Tate colorings. So, um, so a Tate coloring is a, a three coloring of a type trivalent where at each vertex the colors have to be distinct. Um, <coughs> and um, what I'm going to, um, yeah, so. This, if the conjecture is true, that would provide an alternative proof of the four color theorem because there's a rather strong non-vanishing theorem for J-sharp. Uh, so um, a graph is called spatially bridgeless. So, well, in graph theory, there's a notion of a, of a bridgeless graph. So that's a, a graph that if you remove an edge, it, it becomes disconnected. There's a natural generalization to graphs in three space that it notices the embedding, namely the, the graph is bridgeless if there's no two sphere that meets the graph in one edge, transversely at one point in an edge. Um, so um, and what I'm going to kind of sketch is 
uh, a proof of, well, the sort of uninteresting ver uh, part of the conjecture that uh, the dimension of, of J sharp of K is at least the number of Tate colorings. If it was at most the number of Tate colorings, then I'd be much happier. But um, at least the, the theorem, I think, you know, we, we know that for many, uh, for, for many planar graphs, the conjecture is true. Um, and at least the theorem shows you that uh, in a rather natural way, for all graphs, at least it's very tightly constrained by the number of Tate colorings. So, um, <clears throat> and the, the, the proof is going to use a uh, local coefficient version of J-sharp. So I want to going to try and kind of sketch the proof of the theorem. In order to do that, I have to kind of remind you of the definition of J-sharp to begin with, and then how uh, we can use local coefficients to improve our knowledge of its behavior. Um, and uh, yeah, right. so. Um, so the main, um, yeah. so the, the first move is to realize that um, if I have a trivalent graph in a three-manifold, then I can think of that as actually giving me a way of defining an orbifold. Um, and the point, point is that um, if I think of um, the Klein-4 group, Z2 times Z2, acting on R3, orientation-preserving diagonal trans transformations, or diagonal, diagonal matrices, plus minus one matrices is determinant one. Um, the uh, quotient is, um, to, the quotient is again, a, uh, well, if I act on the two-sphere, um, the unit sphere, the quotient is a sphere. Right, it's two, um, if I quotient it out by all plus one minus matrices, the quotient would be an octant. This is two octants glued together, so it's a, it's a two-sphere. Cone on that is then a copy of R3. The, um, yeah. <coughs> and um, if you, so you know, the quotient is this orbifold two-sphere with the, uh, three orbifold points of order two, if you cone that off, then I get a trivalent vertex. So that's, um, you see a trivalent graph, you construct an orbifold by using um, this picture as defining a chart near the tri trivalent vertices and just the standard quotient R2 by Z2 cross, uh, cross R uh, near, near an edge. And, um, so <coughs> we might ca call this process orbifoldification. Um, so for each web, we can get a, an orbifold. And sometimes in the paper, we call them bifolds, just the, you know, it, the orbifold structure is very special. They're only cone angles, pi. So, um, so that's why they're called bifolds. <coughs> um, so. Yeah, so l let me remind, if you haven't seen a talk about this before, remind you a, a bit about the connection with the four color theorem. So, so here I have a graph. If I have a, a you know, so if, if I have any graph, if it's in, sitting in the three sphere, then there's a natural notion of a meridional loop, a, a loop that comes uh, near an edge, goes once around it, and goes back to the base point. If the graph is planar, then in fact the fundamental group of the complement um, is actually generated by a clinical set of meridians. Um, <coughs> now, the, uh, the orbifold fundamental group of the, the orbifold that I defined, it's just the fundamental group of the complement with these, uh, with the squares of typo. Uh, the squares of the meridional elements uh, being one. Now, if you have, uh, so the four color theorem is equivalent to the statement that if for a particular trivalent graph, it's equivalent to the statement that you can three color the edges. 
Um, if you have a three coloring of the edges, then um, you have a representation of the orbifold fundamental group into the Klein four group by declaring that the three colors are labeling the three non-trivial elements of the Klein four. Um, our condition that they're all distinct tells you that that, that condition is consistent. Um, conversely, if you have a representation into the Klein four group, then you get a, a, a three coloring a rep representation with the property that uh, that every meridional element goes to a trivial element. Right? That's the um, Um, so when we deal with floor homology, we uh, often want to study as a, you know, floor homology comes from the Morse uh, uh, from the Morse homology of Simon's function. Turns Simon's function has critical points, representations of the fundamental group. So there's some notation for the space of well, space of representation. Um, into SO3 because we're interested in these Klein 4 group representations. Um, conjugation by SO3 acts on this space. Um, just a little bit of notation. And uh, again, um, <coughs> the flat uh, the space of representations, um, you can identify using the Hohenriemann representation with the space of uh, flat orbifold connections up to up to gauge transformation. Um, and here, here's a little slide that um, <coughs> get you some feeling of why you might hope at the uh, beginning that, that the number of take colorings relate to the um, to the floor homology. If you look at the simplest example, um, right? The unknot, uh, the representation. Present is, is a copy of RP2, just uh, uh, elements of order 2 in, in SO3. Um, that's a copy of RP2. Um, and the number of take colorings is three, three colorings of the unknot. And the, the rank of homology, of course, is, is uh, three. Rank of homology is Z2 coefficients. Um, for the theta graph, the Presentation variety, so I get this prescribed for each of the three edges, an element of order two, such that the product is the identity. Um, so that's just, um, you know, <coughs> it's of the diagonal matrices. So that's a copy of the flag manifold. Um, the number of take colorings is six, and the rank of the homology is. Um, is six, so it corresponds there. Um, the trefoil, while it's not planar, it has an interesting representation variety, and uh, it, you know, you shouldn't expect once you go past the planar case that um, the representation variety has so much to do with tape colorings. The representation variety for something like the, the one skeleton of a cube, though, which is planar, is a complicated mess. Um, I mean, it's not, not that complicated, but it's easy to compute the number of take colorings. The rank of the homology isn't the right thing to look at because the, the representation is singular. Uh, but when you compute the rank of the instanton homology for the cube, it turns out to be 24. So that's a little bit better evidence that this is a, the, the conjecture has some, uh, some meat to it. Um, yeah. All right, so we're going to do gauge theory on this uh, SO3 bundle, uh, on this orbifold SO3 bundle. Um, and so we need a little bit of the notation for that. So the space of connection, gauge of Kuhn's classes of connections on our, uh, on our orbifold bundle. I'm going to keep the principal bundles suppressed through most of the talk. But um, uh, and there's a turn simons function. Critical points, again, are the representations. Um, so, you know, if you're uh, a floor theory aficionado, you know that the kind of 
bane of, uh, bane of our existence in those of us who do it is that um, you know, <coughs> the gate group doesn't act typically doesn't act freely on the space of connections. There are connections that have a stabilizer, and it, it, it's uh, useful to um, to get into a situation where you can avoid connections that have a stabilizer. I want to explain um, explain one way to do that, which is a little different than the way we did it before. Um, so that's the so sort of general notion is notion of a, that we now call it an atom. So we want to deal with connections that have um, get rid of connections that have non-trivial stabilizer. And what we're going to do is replace our by uh, you know uh, make um, new or replace our graph by a new graph. Uh, K sharp, which has just a, an extra copy of the theta graph. So it's an um, ball. The reason that um, so embedded just in a planar way inside some. <coughs> so the reason that that's a, a good thing to do is that the theta graph we already saw it has up to conjugacy it actually has a unique representation into SO3. That representation has it, it's actually into the in its image is a copy of the Klein 4 group. Um, unfortunately, as a representation in SO3, it has a stabilizer because the, you know, the <coughs> normalizer of the Klein 4 group is sitting inside SO3 is the Klein 4 group itself. It's abelian, so it's normal. Um, <coughs> however, so we want to do gauge theory uh, on this manifold that has this chalk would be nice sometimes that has this theta graph right. um, there we go it's got the theta graph in it um, and some not uh, disjoint from it um, so the theta graph has this um, Essentially unique representation. So, um, if you think of what well, uh, now, what what we're going to do um, is do gauge theory, but not using the full SO3 gauge group. We're going to require that the that the gauge transformations lift on some neighborhood of this uh, theta graph. The effect of that is that actually um, the Three non-trivial elements of the stabilizer don't lift to to, uh, to SU two, so um, so that gets rid of the stabilizer problem, and um, slightly overly technical um, uh, bit of blah 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 about how to say what we want to do, but so, you know, we're doing gauge theory on this three manifold, um, but we just want to have this slightly, uh, um, you know, bespoke gauge group that's acting to, uh, once we d pass the K-sharp, um, no flat connection has a stabilizer. Um, all right, so, we, so we're going to look at, um, I might, sometimes the graph is called gamma by accident. It's supposed to be called K. Uh, sometimes the three manifold disappears from the notation. But um, one nice thing about passing to the um, to K sharp is that its representation variety is the based representation variety of the original graph. Um, and <clears throat> anyway, so once we uh, once we pass to this situation um, to to the sharp story, um, then there are no um, <coughs> there are no reducible connections that we have to worry about. So we can just do the Morse homology for the chern simons function. Um, and um, th there's one very interesting.
recently, um, you know, so more somology, we look at, you know, we perturb things somehow, we look at the critical points, look at the flow lines, and then at some point we want to prove d squared is zero, right? So we look at one dimensional, or moduli spaces between critical points that have index difference two, <coughs> and, um, you know, we're dealing with instantons. Instantons have, uh, there's a pulling phenomenon. Um, and we're dealing with SU2 or SO3 instantons. When you bubble at a, this orbifold context, when you bubble at a point um, away, so if you think of this four dimensional map, has this two dimensional complex in it. Where can you bubble? So you can bubble away from the two complex. Then there's a dimension drop of eight. That's not going to affect the two dimensional moduli space. There's a dimension drop of four if you bubble at a two dimensional face. And then there's a, dim which is also not going to affect a d squared equals zero argument. But if you bubble at a, a seam, so a, where the <coughs> a neighborhood that looks like a y times r, you bubble at one of those points, there's a dimension drop of two, and that can screw up d squared equals zero. And in fact, <coughs> um, it, it does in the sense that you can't define this theory over the integers. Um, the d squared isn't zero. It's in fact a multiple of four. But you can do it with z2 coefficients. So. Um, and the, the four, by the way, is the order of the Klein four group. That's the sort of, there's a, a gluing parameter, which if you can glue one way, you can do glue four ways. So, <coughs> um, and anyway, that's not going to come up. Okay. <coughs> <You know. coughs> so that's the, a very brief definition of the old story. There's this annoying bit about the markings, and then uh, things work out fine. <coughs> What we want to do is um, pull out in the, with finite dimensional Morse theory. If you have a finite dimensional manifold, if it has non-trivial fundamental group, then you can look at uh, <coughs> you can look at the Morse homology with twisted coefficients. So that's what we're going to uh, do. We want to so and the, the fundamental group of of B sharp is <coughs> um, is pi naught of the, the gauge group. So there's some things to look at there, um, which we're going to use in different ways, one of which already appeared in the J-sharp story. So <coughs> if you have uh, an edge of the, look at an edge of the graph, we have this orbifold SO3 bundle, right? Well, it doesn't quite give you a bundle edge because the, the um, you know, there's a bundle on the two-fold cover, but we have a Z2 action. A Z2 action has a one-dimensional uh, fixed eigenspace and a two-dimensional eigenspace where it acts non-trivially. On if you think of the R3 bundle, right? That's the, that's how the action, that's how the Z2 is supposed to act. So the two-dimensional bit doesn't push down, but the one-dimensional bit does push down. So there's a, along each edge, um, there's, a <coughs> there's a line bundle. I mean, so we pick a base point on the edge, we, we get a line bundle. And that line bundle then gives us a line bundle over the space. Uh, so give, a real line bundle, so it gives us a two-dimensional cohomology class. The two, so it's E2 cohomology class. Um, so we're going to use those. And another bit of the topology uh, of the or fundamental group of the configuration spaces, we're going to use um, we're going to use the fact that we use this theta graph in a very strong way. So <coughs> um, you know, so it, it, I have this orbifold bundle. Uh, over the theta graph using SU2 gauge transformations. It turns out that you can think of a gauge transformation as a, you know, on a closed manifold, gauge transformations are sections of a bundle of groups. So a bundle of groups associated to the principal bundle by the adjoint action. 
um, in this pulled con uh, it's still true, true that it's a section of a, well, it's not quite a bundle of groups, but uh, there's a space of groups. It's not a fiber bundle because of or changes. The, the fiber over a point away from the theta graph um, is a copy of SU2. Over each edge, it's a copy of U1. And over the two vertices of the theta graph, it's, it's uh, the identity. So, um, so in particular, um, you know, I've got this theta graph. And if I have a gauge transformation, then I can compute its degree as a map to U1 along each of the three edges. Right. So there, there's a um, so there's a map from pi naught z3. So or equivalently, um, sort of classifying that map, there's a, a map from the configuration space um, to the three torus. So no, that's one cube. Right? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to the one-dimensional cohomology classes, they're going to give us interesting operators on our cohomology, on our floor homology, and we're going to use twisted coefficients coming from this, this theta graph. Um, so <coughs> back in the, in the J-sharp situation, um, sorry, this one-dimensional cohomology class, and I can, if I have a pair of critical points, I can evaluate that one count how many times that a flow line passes through uh, the floor homology. Um, so this is just J-sharp, not twisted coefficient. And the interesting thing that you can prove about this operator is that its cube is zero. So it's a, it, you can eventually prove it's non-trivial. In fact, if you think the, the floor homology Critical, the critical set for the unknot in this story was our, and <clears throat> what you find, you know, Z2 with this um, guy acting, it's just the sort of standard thing. It's just uh, the floor homology is isomorphic to Z2 with uh, polynomial algebra with Z, uh, with one generator U equals zero. So, um, yeah. So that, that's how we use that, those one-dimensional cohomology classes coming from the edges. We're going to use the, this map to the three torus to the final local coefficient system. Um, so the local coefficient system is supposed to be called gamma, not the graph. Okay? So sometimes it'll be both. But, um, so, um, and it, it's just uh, um, for the local coefficient system is its fiber is isomorphic to the Z2 group ring. Everything's with Z2 coefficients of the fundamental group of the three torus. In other words, um, Laurent polynomials and three variables with Z2 coefficients. And um, this is, you know, uh, kind of nice definition of the, so I'm gonna, there's a map to the three torus, so I just need to define the local coefficient system on the three torus. The fiber above a, a given point in the three torus, thinking of it as R3 mod Z3, there's a point in R3 mod Z3, it's the span of the monomials of the form uh, T to the X, T to the Y, T to the Z. So here we think of these, uh, um, as so think of the exponents as being integers, but they're constrained by the fact that they represent the point that you're looking at in the three torus. So you, in other, no. this is just a translate of the polynomial algebra sort of by the element of the three torus. And in that way, if you have a, if you have a path in the three torus, that path tells you how to compare the two local coefficient systems. That's what you need. You need a, uh, you know, a parallel transport. And 
Um, that, that's natural in that description. Okay, so now you, you can repeat the, uh, the Morse homology construction, where now the, the differential keeps track of, as a differential is a, a path in the configuration space, now I map that path to the three torus using the map H, and then I use the sort of parallel transport uh, to give me an additional coefficient in the differential. So um, <coughs> the so the, this you know, there's many other properties from properties of J sharp, which we'll kind of go th remind ourselves and go through. But um, so there's excision, there are exact triangles. Um, <coughs> but the thing that turns out to be the most important difference is that um, that the magic relation u cubed equals zero uh, for edge is now u cubed equals pu, where p is this interesting little polynomial, which um, I don't. It should be one, two, three. All of them, I think. Not, I don't know why these are uh, muted. It should, it should be one, two, three. So uh, anyway, it, you know, there's, um, yeah. So, yeah, the takeaway from this slide in any case is that this, the relation u cubed equals zero deforms. And that will buy us quite a bit in computing things. Get you some idea of what um, what the floor homology looks like. Here's the floor homology um, standard. Sorry. This is just standard J sharp. There shouldn't be a gamma there. This is J sharp um, with the local coefficient system. So nothing terribly interesting happens for RP2, or the flag map gives you however many copies of Z2. Now you have how many of uh, Laurent polynomial algebra. Something interesting happens here for the trefoil. Um, here it was just rank seven over two coefficients. But here um, it's got three copies of uh, this polynomial algebra, and then it has some p portion. So p is not always going to be that uh, polynomial that appeared there. For the cube, um, it turns out that, again, <coughs> um, it's uh, nothing interesting happens. In fact, um, so um, our conjecture about the, the rank being equal to the number of take colorings eventually you can show is it's equivalent to the statement that for a planar graph, um, the, the twisted coefficient group is torsion free. So just, you don't have to worry about what its rank actually is. You just have to check that it's torsion free. That might not be any easier really, but it's a very different sounding statement. Um, so I wanna, what time did I start? <laughs> Neither do I. 415. All right, so, um, so what I want to do is kind of spell out some consequences of this new edge relation. And I mean, quite a little story um, happens. So um, in order to simplify the to do is first, um, first we're going to work with the uh, ring where we allow ourselves to divide by this polynomial p. So R prime is the um, is Laurent polynomials that we divided by p, and then there's a corresponding local coefficient system. <coughs> um, so you notice then that so remember we had u cubed equals pu, so u to the fourth is pu. Squared. So that means that this now that I've allowed myself to divide by p, that uh, this 1 over p u squared is a projection. It squares 
equal square of pi e is pi e. Right? Um, and um, in fact, it's easy to check that the kernel, again, if we've inverted p, the kernel of ue is the image of 1 plus pi e. That should be pi e. The image of ue is the image of pi e. Um, so, um, it, in other words, uh, once I pass the gamma prime, uh, if I have any set of edges, then um, because of this projection, I can uh, pull off a direct sum in, which is just the intersection of the kernels. I mean, the intersection of the kernels is this projection um, tells you that it's actually a direct sum in. Now, um, there's some relations in a vertex. So, at a vertex um, <coughs> in the old story, in the J-sharp story, um, so if I have three edges meeting at a vertex, then I have three edge operators, U, E, U, F, and U, D, and they satisfy the relations of the, of the mod 2 cohomology of the flag manifold, which I have written for you there. Um, <coughs> so um, when, uh, when you do the analogous um, story uh, for the twisted coefficients, um, then the first and third relation remain the same, but the second one deforms. And it, you get this uh, copy, copy of P. And that lets you um, define some further projections. So, so I should have not made this all jump off at the same time. So <clears throat> you notice that uh, P times UE up at there at the top. Uh, so P was equal to this uh, monomial of degree 2. So P times UE times UF, that's the monomial of degree 2 times UE UF. But um, <coughs> um, what do I say? Yeah, but remember that uh, if in that product, if all three things appear at zero because of the three-dimensional relation. So the only thing that's left is, is uh, ue squared, uf squared. So in other words, there's another projection, uh, pi ef, which is 1 over uh, p v uf, et cetera. So you have these three, uh, three projections, which, well, once I divide it by p, then, then um, <coughs> these three projections um, add up to one. Right? Just divided that two-dimensional relation, uh, monomials of degree two relation by, but, sorry, the, the composition of any of these two projections, any two distinct of these projections is zero. Because again, that composition involves a product of all three things, right? So, um, so these are, um, you know, disjoint projections, and it, you can also simulate that, um, you know, that the projection for the edge and the projection for this pair of edges, that because that involves all three guys, that's zero. Um, on the other hand, this guy, uh, you know. Behaves like, <coughs> behaves like that, and uh, yeah, well, the product of these guys is, is that. Guy. So, um, in, in particular, um, at each vertex, I can. So, if if I have I had my previous decomposition, but now I can write that decomposition as a sum of these three terms coming from these three projections from the edges, and notice that if this guy is non-zero, then um, at most one of these guys belongs to S. So S is the simultaneous kernel of the U's, right? So 
<coughs> um, if we have some, yeah, if we have some C, some element C in here, and uh, UE and UF kill it, then uh, then C is equal to um, is equal to this thing, but uh, all three of those terms have a year and F in them, so that's zero. Right? Uh, what that means is um, so. It's a nice way of a uh, nice bit of graph theory terminology that encodes what this all this says. Um, so it, uh, a one set in a graph is a subset of the edges, so that every vertex belongs to a unique edge in this. And uh, I'll let S one of G denote the set of one sets of a graph. So, for example. Um, Right, little c here, but the, uh, the underlying graph here is supposed to be the one skeleton of a dodecahedron, and the red edges here are a one set, so that each vertex belongs to uh, exactly one of these edges. Um, <clears throat> so what we just learned is that Actually, this uh, group, these uh, gamma prime coefficients, they're a direct sum over one set, right? Because, I mean, you know, um, it's an intersection of kernels of edge operators where you can never have two edges. And this the group is zero if two edges meet. So um, that's just a restatement. And, and you, you notice, um, so <clears throat> to kind of telegraph what's happening here. If you think about uh, where we're headed, if you think about, suppose you, you, you have a three coloring of a planar graph, then there are three obvious one sets, namely the things that are um, the edges of a given color. And um, if you look at the complement, of those edges, it's what's called a two-set or a Hamiltonian uh, union of, of union of, of closed curves in the graph that pass through all of the edges. Right. So if you look at this guy, anyway, it's through all the edges once. So that in this case, it, it, there's really a Hamil the, the complement of these red edges is really a Hamiltonian path connected. But in general, it just will be a Hamiltonian cycle. And um, if you have a one set, and you think about it, it's the, you know, so you might think, aha, I will search for one set in my um, planar graph. I find a one set, and I'm very happy for a minute, and then I try and color the the, uh, the complementary two set. Well, you, you can only color it if it's got a if each of the cycles has an even number of edges, because right? you have to every time you go you have to keep changing color. You can't come back to the same color. So, so uh, a three coloring a take coloring is a, equivalent to um, having a two set with where every cycle has an edge. Okay, so, um, all right. So we've got this direct sum decomposition, um, and uh, uh, according to one sets of our graph. So that, by, by the way, that so far I haven't used that the graph was in the three sphere. It's just any graph in any three manifold in the decomposition of this. Uh, gamma prime four homology into one set. Now, <clears throat> as I as I mentioned, um, this floor homology group has many the twisted coefficient group has many uh, um, properties analogous to the ordinary one. 
the simplest property is that if, if you have a, uh, a split graph, a graph that has two components, or you know, it, not necessarily connected, but it's uh, so split in the, in the geometric sense, that there's a two sphere that separates the graph into two pieces, um, <coughs> then um, assuming, so now we have to be a tiny bit careful because the Z2 co um, there's no Kunnath theorem with, now we're dealing with these uh, tools. Um, so it's a you know, possibility of a Kunnath kind of situation, but if one of these guys is free, for example, then there's a tensor product decomposition. And, um, similarly, if you have a split cobordism, um, then the induced map is just the tensor product map acting on the tensor product. So those are <coughs> um, not, <coughs> not unexpected. Um, and another thing is that there are, there are exact triangles that relate these guys. So, um, <coughs> so we imagine webs that are identical outside three, uh, outside a given three ball and inside, it's either, you see, uh, you know, so the web is doing something interesting and then it attaches uh, to those points on the two sphere. Um, and here I see uh, three different copies of uh, an H that sit inside the three ball in an interesting way. Um, so the upper picture meant to uh, see a natural Z3 symmetry the picture. And there's a, a more standard, plainer looking picture of the same thing below. Um, so as, as I mentioned, uh, <coughs> foams induced maps, this is meant to, um, there's a, uh, a, a foam cobordism between any of these two pictures. So what I've drawn, what, what this picture here is meant to be is that there's supposed to be a cobordism in uh, ball, three ball times I, and I projected that cobordism into the three ball. And um, so from, so the yellow bits are um, the, uh, the surface, so that surface has, um, you know, there's a, this sort of hyperboloid sitting in, in a nice way, and then there's these two half disks that, um, that come in uh, as well, actually. Ooh, wow. great. So yeah, there's, a, there's a half disk here and a half disk here, and then you stretch that out into four space that's giving you a, a cobordism which has, um, in this case, it has a tetrahedral point. Um, anyway, so it, if you have the floor homology groups with the, these twisted coefficients, just as the ordinary one does, they satisfy an exact, uh, long exact sequence like this. Um, and um, there are some further exact sequences slightly, maybe slightly more familiarly, um, we have these three uh, <coughs> um, just um, you know, a pair of strands in the three ball uh, sitting like that. Um, so it, it turns out that um, in this game, you either get to use three copies of H in the way that I had that L. Um, L2, L1, L0, or there's also an exact sequence that involves one copy with, a, with an H in it and two of these guys. Okay, so there's also an exact triangle. Um, so that looks like to remember, but turns out to fit nicely into this. It takes a little while to digest, but um, <coughs> so here, so, um, so what did I just say? I said there were four exact triangles, right? And the four exact triangles, the, the, there's the one that's sort of in the back triangle that involves C, eta, and zeta. 
that's the first one, and then the uh, other ones involve copies of K, so there's, there's B, Q, uh, R, S, and A, and then um, there's this one in front, uh, gamma, lambda, and uh, kappa. So th this, this is actually a, a commutative diagram, it turns out, as well. Um, so that is uh, here, uh, <coughs> uh, A followed by B is the same as gamma, et cetera. So um, in, in some, these guys are, these yellow guys are commutative, uh, sorry, these guys, the yellow ones are the exact triangles. Um, the purple ones are commutative triangles, and you have this beautiful picture. So th this, is, it, you know, um, this is sort of a geometric uh, instance of uh, octahedral axiom in triangulated categories. Kind of nice to see it in some simple, beautiful setting where. I can understand it. Um, so what I want to do now is, is consider the consequences. Remember, where are we? So we, we, we know that our floor homology group decomposes uh, according to one set. Right? And it satisfies these exact triangles. So now we want to see how those two interact with each other. So let's think about the, just the triangle that comes from this front face, so uh, lambda, kappa, and gamma. Okay, now, um, so, <coughs> um, let's think about, sorry, no. pictures rotated a bit, but no matter. Um, so, so these, these three guys fit into an exact triangle, and um, the red bits, so let, let's imagine we pick a one set and see how it interacts with this diagram. Okay, so this is a possible way that it, it can interact, right? The red hits both vertices once, good. Um, this guy doesn't extend over this. Right? It does extend over this. So if I look at triangle restricted to this sum end, this group is zero. So these are isomorphic. Right? And um, you can, there's another instance. So um, this, the middle group doesn't appear. The outside groups are isomorphic. Now, the first two groups are isomorphic. The last one doesn't appear. Uh, first two groups are isomorphic. Last one doesn't appear. Uh, here, the um, second two groups are isomorphic. The first one doesn't appear. Right? There's only one interesting situation. This, uh, that guy's compatible with all three. So the the interesting part of the exact triangle is, um, is sort of there. Uh, but we can learn a lot from the non-interesting part. What we can look at that is that, um, suppose we have two webs um, in our three manifold, <coughs> and we've given one set, given one set's um, webs K and K prime, one sets S and S prime for the respective um, knots. And uh, we look at the complementary closed loops, that gives us C and C prime. And uh, suppose that they're the same as subsets. Okay, so in other words, my, my webs are up, given by taking a pair of, uh, taking a closed loop and just joining a bunch of uh, arcs between the loops, maybe back to itself, in such a way that that, that, that's, that gives me a graph and the, the joining is creating the one sets. So that 
um, so the hypothesis here, so first, the complementary one sets are supposed to be the same, just as subsets of Y. We don't remember the vertices anymore. And um, the one sets are supposed, to one sets S and S prime are supposed to define the same relative homology class in Y relative to C, C equals C prime, so it's the same group. Then the claim is that actually the sum end corresponding to those guys is the same, isomorphic. And um, why, why is that? Yeah. So, um, let's, see. Let, let's go back. Um, let's go back to this picture first. So. What does this picture tell us? It tells us that, um, you know, it, it, so it, this is telling us that I can modify my one set by doing sort of a, a surgery on it. And I don't change, right? Now, <coughs> um, So, um, okay, so one thing we learned is that we, we can modify the one set by doing uh, a surgery on it. That doesn't change the answer. Another thing we know is, well, suppose that the, the one set has just a, a disjoint copy of a circle in it. Right? So you know, the, the floor homology of the circle is rank three. The floor homology for that one set is rank one. And the connect sum property tells us that you know, some property is compatible with this decomposition. So it tells us that if I have a disjoint copy of a circle as part of my one set, then it's the same as just erasing it or adding it. And um, one more thing we need to know. Um, <coughs> So let's look at this picture, and let's suppose that all, all we have is that the, uh, you know, so these two groups are isomorphic in this story, and suppose my uh, graph has just this, um, you know, just this path as part of it, or this guy. So for this one, if I have this, then that, I have a circle that's part of my one set, so the same thing as just getting rid of it. On the other hand, this guy is just, if I look at this thing, it's just adding, I've just blown up my graph by adding a bygone and requiring that one of the edges of the bygone is part of my one set. But think about it, <coughs> what's a homology between two one sets look like? It looks like births and deaths adding or subtracting a disjoint circle, or it could be a birth and death, um, you know, where you're just adding a bygone and adding that bygone to the one set, or it's a surgery. So that's, that's, the, that's the proof. And then, um, <coughs> that's it. yeah, so, so, um, the last thing uh, to, to see why this, the, in the planar case, it's counting the number of colorings. Imagine you have a, a, a planar graph, and you pick a, a one set for that graph. So um, you look at the complementary circles. Well, um, there are, uh, um, so suppose that, um, so I look at one, one of the circles. If there's an odd number of edges from the one set coming in, and what I can do is, well, or let's just say this. You know, I, I can always reduce the number of edges that impact on a given circle to zero or one by leaving its homology class the same. Either, you know, if there are 
two edges from my one set coming in, then I can add a little bubble to it and then um, move the edges together and then pull the bubble off or whatever. So, um, so I can always assume that it's either got zero or one um, edges from the one set impinging on a given circle. And then, well, if it's got, an, if it's got one, it's got a bridge. Right, now I've created a graph with the same floor homology for that one set, but now it has a bridge, so it's zero. So it must be zero at the end. So in other words, um, if it have an even one set, then um, it's the same as the floor homology where I just have n circles in the plane, n circles in the plane by the tensor product formula is a free module of rank two to the n. So in other words, that's exactly counting the number of tape colonies, right? Each one set, for each given one set, um, you only count um, when I count them at ones that are even, that's the right answer, and then uh, each of the circles contributes two colonies to the total um, total number to then for the guy. So that's yeah, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> Oh, that, that was an old talk. Yeah, no, okay. Um, yeah. I mean, the, 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 so there's a bunch of nice stuff happens once you have this, because now you, you know. Um, I said I was done. But I will dabble a little more. Um, so, you know, how should you think about this? So, um, what, what this group is trying to measure. So, you know, what we, um, so, you know, representations in the SO3 setting, there can be the ones that are we map into the Klein four group. Right. And um, seems to be going on in this story is that that the um, how's it, the uh, you know, these Klein four group guys, they're the ones that are trying to contribute copies of this free module. And then stuff that has smaller stabilizer is, trying, is typically, we think, contributing torsion. So it's a bit like, you know, it's, a, it's what you'd expect kind of for equivariant. There's, you know, you think of SO3 as acting on this space, and then there's some kind of SO3 equivariant cohomology. You expect um, the stuff that has non-trivial stabilizer to contribute, you know, lots of stuff to the homology infinite rank, and the stuff that's, uh, that doesn't contributes torsion over the uh, equivariant homology of the group. Anyway, so. Yes, Professor Ashvan. No. Yes, of course. Go ahead. What about it? Yeah, well, haven't proved it. Well, we think we're closer to it. You know, I think that's one of those things that I can't say until it's there or not. I mean, no, you know, it, it's, I mean, you know, it, this seemed pretty cool. There's a lot of interesting structure that doing this, um, you know, starts to pull out. Um, but, 
you know, is that enough? Uh, not yet. No, it has. N it, it, it somehow has nothing to do with any other. Well, I, I, let, let me say it this way. So, um, you know, one could imagine trying. You, know, you can do floor homology with other Lie groups, and then um, you know. It's known, um, you know. So these guys are. This, this story, at least J sharp without twisted coefficients, it somehow looks a lot like a mod two version of the Havana uh, SL three story. And that story, well, it, it does count three col in take colorings, except that only for bipartite graphs. So. You know, I mean, there, there are a lot of relations between colorings in, in um, you know, if, you, if you look at SLN, Havana uh, Frozansky, the relation to colorings there. But, you know, somehow, um, you know, the thing that seems interesting is that the, um, you know, the four color theorem itself seems to have a, a special place in three manifold topology in this stuff. So um, yes. I mean for for a knot the you, you know well yeah yeah um no, it's more interesting than that. Yeah, but that that yeah, that's a. Um, 